And I'm so excited to hear about these comeback critters, particularly river otters, because they're one of my favorites. <laughs> Indeed. I can see why. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, I'm, I am packed in a lot of information for the next hour. We're going to cover a great deal of content. I'm going to keep it at a very steady pace and try not to get off track too much, which I have a tendency to do a little bit. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to betray the quality of the content that I'm providing you, but I'm going to keep it at a steady pace so we have some time for questions at the end or any comments you want to make. I'll share contact information. So, of course, you can follow up with me or you can send additional questions that you might think of later to Jen, and I'll be happy to answer those at a later date, too. So um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into it. I have been with the Division of Wildlife for almost 18 years now, and it's been a very, very fast 18 years. I really enjoy my job. I spend a lot of time talking about Ohio's wildlife and teaching about it, but I also um, work as a media relations liaison. So I work with reporters who want to, to um, do stories about wildlife. And I, under normal circumstances, travel to, to uh, different festivals and county fairs and trade shows throughout Northeast Ohio and teach about wildlife that way too. So it's a, a very job with lots of different hats, which was what keeps me going. And I am especially passionate about talking about these critters tonight. And I am with you guys. I'm seeing the comments that you're excited about otters and bobcats. And I know otters are one of Jen's favorite critters and I can totally see why. Um, so these, this is just a really, really fun and very uh, cool presentation that I get to be a part of tonight. So if you're not familiar with ODNR, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, we're a pretty big agency, one of the biggest state agencies in the state of Ohio. And we have a, a lot of different divisions. So you can picture ODNR as a, a big umbrella. And within, underneath that umbrella are different agencies. And we all work together to protect our natural resources. And Division of Wildlife, of course, protects wildlife in the state of Ohio for the enjoyment um, of others, whether it's through hunting or fishing or wildlife watching. We want wildlife to be around for future generations so that we can enjoy it now, but our, our children and our grandchildren can enjoy it later. So we believe strongly in conservation. And um, if there was more time, I'd spend more time on that. But basically, Division of Wildlife um, encourages Ohioans to use our wildlife resources wisely. And that's why we can hunt and we can fish and we can watch wildlife and there's always critters around for us to enjoy and the populations are continuing to grow, which is what we're going to focus on tonight. And then there's other agencies, our sister agencies also within ODNR, and they believe strongly in preservation because that has its place too. And preservation is to set it aside. Maybe it's a very fragile habitat that has flowers that are found nowhere else. And that's why there's not hiking allowed there or dogs allowed on that property because it's very, very high, highly protected, not used wisely, at least for now. So I hope that helps. We all have our niches. We all have our, our tasks and responsibilities. And I feel like Division of Wildlife is the best of the agencies, but I can be a little bit biased. So with that said, this is what we're gonna cover tonight in the can next pop, 15. Oh, can I pop in just for one moment? Right please. now, the um, view that I'm seeing is the speaker oh. view. So just give a little, Oops, thank you for clearing that up. Dang, I figured we'd wait until you get to the animals. <laughs> All right. All Perfect. right. Okay, how's that look? Looks great, thank, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Sorry about that, folks. This is, should be much better now. So we're gonna cover bears, bobcats, river otters, and fishers. Some very quick crash course ID on how to tell these creatures from other critters population distribution and what their current trends are, what they eat, what kind of habitat they prefer or at least can tolerate, some other fun facts as time allows, and then we'll close on how you can help monitor wildlife in Ohio. So what do we have here? There's some hints on the screen. Of course, it's a black bear and you may be surprised, maybe not, that we have black bears in Ohio. If you live in or around Portage County, you're more likely to be unsurprised that we have black bears in, if, than if you were from the western part of the state because we have some considerable black bear activity and we'll break that down a little bit. 
as you might know, um, we have our surrounding states with very high or at least very healthy populations of black bears. So three of our neighboring states have pretty substantial black bear populations. And then Kentucky to our south, west or to our south, they have a few hundred bears and they contribute to a little bit ebb and flow in Southern Ohio, but nothing compared to West Virginia. And so we get most of our black bear activity from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. They were extirpated from the state of Ohio by the mid 1800s, as were, as were many species. And extirpated is a little bit different than extinct. Extinct is gone forever. So the passenger pigeon, Carolina parakeet, Labrador duck, these are species that no longer exist in the flesh on, on the globe at all. And, but black bears are, were extirpated from the state of Ohio, meaning that they existed elsewhere, maybe in Western states where it wasn't being so heavily uh, populated by humans. The, the state hadn't received that wave yet, um, but they weren't found in their native range of Ohio. So I hope that that makes sense to you. I can always clarify later at, towards the end if, if you need more um, information about that. But we finally started seeing black bear activity completely on its own in Ohio in the mid 1980s. And this was likely healthy populations growing in our neighboring states. We didn't reintroduce black bears. They came here completely on their own by the 1980s. And because we were seeing so much activity, we decided to start a formal reporting procedure and following these observations in the um, early 90s. And now the black bear in the state of Ohio is considered a state endangered species. So we're aware of its presence, we're monitoring its presence, but by no means is it a common critter. And black bears are the smallest species of bear in North America. Males can get up to 400 pounds, sometimes a lot more, but that's average where females are about half that size. They can stand up to six feet tall if they're standing on their hind legs to, because they're very curious creatures. They'll stand on their hind legs to get a really good view of the surrounding area. They don't have great eyesight, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But typically when they're on all fours, they stand about three feet at the shoulder. And if you look at that track on this slide, do you, how many toes do you count? Five, right? Just like on human feet. So we typically have five toes. We have a pretty substantial foot pad. We're flat footed when we step. If we were bare, if you were bare feet and you stepped in a, a little muddy spot, you'd probably see most of your foot pad. But the front foot, as you can see in this left side of the, the illustration, they only have about a half step. So only half their foot pad um, actually shows up in the track. So the front foot is going to be a little bit smaller compared to the back foot where they plant that whole foot pad down. And this is very human-like to me. So I'm not saying Sasquatch exists or doesn't exist. That is not what we're debating tonight, but I'm just pointing out that black bear tracks look very human-like. So that'll help you with ID later on. So speaking of ID, look at this picture and think to yourself or, or participate in that Q&A box. Is this a black bear? I know it's blurry, but this is a very average, very typical photo of pictures that are emailed to us with requests for ID or confirmation. Some pictures are easier than others. So this one is not the easiest one. So this picture made it tough for us to determine, are we really looking at a black bear? Based on the, just physical characteristics, it's tough to tell, but we take into account a lot of different questions and a lot of different factors. So besides the fact that it does kind of look black bear-like, we see the black fur, and it's very furry animal, very dense fur. We also think about behavior, like what else is gonna be climbing a tree that looks like this. So this was a photo that was also sent at the same time that was taken a few minutes later. And you can probably make the right guess in, in looking and saying that this is indeed a black bear. And this is a young black bear. And I can tell that by those pretty substantial ears. It hasn't uh, quite grown into its ears per se. So its head is still kind of small and those ears are kind of big. But if you look at that big bulky body, even though it's a young bear, I mean, there's not a lot that you're gonna be able to mistake except for a large dog. And at a fleeting glance, that can be confusing. So you just have to try to determine based on its behavior and its characteristics, is it a dog or is it a bear? And some looks are, are better than others. So let's move on and talk about what makes a bear a bear besides just it's uh, a fleeting glance of its physical characteristics. I have a black bear skull here. There's also one on your screen, but look at, it's just an amazing predator. 
and these massive canines are perfect for ripping and tearing at flesh. But it also has some great molars for grinding down plant material and fruits and nuts. So they are omnivores. They are the epitome of an omnivore. They eat about anything that they can get a hold of and they can chew it up just fine and they can dig digest it just fine. And in fact, black bears don't hunt a lot. They'll maybe hunt rodents here and there and, and large black bears that really need to fuel their body may go after something larger, but they black bears don't typically put much energy into hunting, which is why they can really depend on plant material, flowers and grasses and fruits and nuts, because that's just easier. And it's almost guaranteed that stuff's not gonna run away. And if you look at the, the orbital cavity here where the eyeball goes, if you can see compared to my index finger, it's really not that big. I mentioned they don't have great eyesight. If you squint, that's about how good a bear's eyesight is. They don't see very well, which is why they stand up on their hind legs and try to get a better view of the landscape. But man, they make up for it with some amazing sniffers. They have impressive sinus cavities that allow them to smell from miles away. And that's often how they're able to locate their food. So once they digest that food that they're able to eat, then you'll see in the picture that they do what bears do in the woods and elsewhere. And this is not real scat, by the way, this is just rubber or silicone, but it looks pretty authentic, right? And bear scat, as I mentioned, eat a lot of fruits and nuts. So you're gonna see those seeds and the scat plus maybe feathers, maybe fur, they will definitely scavenge on carrion. And you see how blocky, how tubular this scat is and look how big it is. So even the small black bears, the young black bears that we typically see in Ohio are gonna have some substantial scat. And we often refer in Division of Wildlife as black bears to black bears as overgrown raccoons because they're very, very similar in behavior and, and what they eat and their scat. But if you find a scat this big and you think it's from a raccoon, that's a pretty massive raccoon. Moving on, what kind of habitat they like? Well, it's where they can find their favorite food. So it can vary, but they really like dense forests. They are tree bears. They like to be where they feel safe and that's hiding in behind trees or in trees or excellent climbers. So that's their preferred habitat, but they like to have openings. They like forests that have some openings where grasses and and flowers grow that they can munch on. Wetlands are great for so many species and black bears are certainly included in that. Their territories can vary a lot, especially in Ohio when there's not a lot of expansive range where they can just stretch their legs and, and, and not run into humans and roadways. But in Southern Ohio, that's a different story. Northeast Ohio is pretty chock full of human activity, making it tough for a black bear but in Southern Ohio, it's a different story. So they probably have a larger range. It just often depends, regardless of the species, if they can find the essential things that they need to survive comfortably, food, water, shelter, and space. So their territories are often dependent on that. They have to be a few years old before they can reproduce. So black bears aren't the most prolific, prolific reproducers. They are in no way like rabbits and mice. They take a few years to be sexually mature. And then by the time that after a few years, they're ready to breed. Breeding happens in late May or any time till about August. And black bears will only have one litter every couple of years. So again, not the most prolific breeders. They spend a lot of time and energy with their cubs to make sure their cubs are as successful and strong and healthy as possible. The neat thing about black bears is that they have delayed implantation. So even though they're breeding in the summer months, they actually, that egg actually isn't fertilized until late fall. And this is when the female goes into hibernation or even torpor, which is kind of a light, it's a light hibernation, a deep sleep, but not true hibernation. So they might torpor, but regardless, the cubs are born about a month and a half after that fertilization. So mom is half asleep when she's giving birth to her cub or her cubs. So um, I know a lot of moms are like sitting at home right now thinking, wow, females can have a few cubs. It's not unheard of to see a female with three cubs, but it's been documented that Black bear sows can produce up to six cubs, but typically it's about three cubs. And then they'll venture out and be ready for adventure at about three months old. They'll stay with mom 
through the summer. And then that's when she's ready to boot them out, especially males. She will boot out her males to get them as far away as possible when she's preparing for the next generation. She'll tolerate females or her daughters. She'll tolerate them a little closer to home, but not the boys. And their lifespan are, is 15 to 25 years in the wild. So they have obstacles, not so much disease, although disease can affect black bears, but road kills and hunting are their major um, obstacles. So in, here's a, an illustration of the status of black bear activity in our surrounding states. So the yellow means that there's no hunting. So because it's a state endangered species in Ohio, we don't allow hunting. They're completely protected by state laws. And that's the same with our Western neighbor in Indiana. They've had very few reports. And in fact, just last year they had a report and that was in the form of a roadkill in the Southern part of the state where most of the activity occurs. So they've had very few uh, dealings with black bears, but in the green states, the populations are in the thousands, um, some in, in the 20 thousands or more and, and to keep conflicts at bay and road kills at bay and to allow opportunity there is hunting regulated hunting so how do we track bobcat or bob, not bobcat we haven't gotten there yet how do we track black bear reports so this is our a copy of our observation report if i got a report from the public and they wanted to let me know that there is a black bear hanging around in their yard. This is all the information that I'm going to try and collect. So the date and the location, which is just, we keep it for ourselves. We don't publish the location. So if you call us, we will keep it, keep it confidential. The age is just the best guess. Does it look like a really young one or is it a full sturdy, full grown, very, uh, very big black bear? The confirmed um, question is, is it absolutely a black bear? Did you think might be, but you're not positive it was a black bear or it's a fleeting glance or you saw tracks, but they were kind of muddy and not real clear, but you think they're black bears. So we have unconfirmed reports are confirmed. Confirmed is that we have photos of black bears, of scat, of tracks, we have fur, uh, any, and it, photos are, are hard to argue. Uh, unless there's like a cacti, a cacti in the background and then that's questionable, but, um, we will label either confirmed or unconfirmed and then ask if it was creating any kind of conflict. Was it raiding your garbage? Was it raiding be, be, uh, your uh, apiaries, um, beehives, or was it just lumbering through the yard, not causing any kind of disturbance, just being present? So that all that information is really valuable to us. And you can either call us or email us to tell us about it, but you can also visit wildohio.gov and report it online there too. And at the very end of this presentation, I'll go over to how you do that online. So this is a, a great graph to show you the population, the number of sightings of black bears over the course of several months. And as you see, if you can make out the colors, hopefully you can, you'll see that in March, we that blue line, that's the one that spikes the highest. We, um, in 2015, we saw the number of sightings uh, exceed 50. And that was followed by in 2018, it was a little bit lower, but still up there. And then in 2016, um, the red, you'll see that only got to just below 30 sightings. Every year we see a peak. You can see that there's still a trend there where in January it's pretty low, then it starts to climb starting in March. It peaks in the mid or early, to, to midsummer, and then it starts to fall again. This is very typical. And we this is when the females, the moms are booting their kids out, telling them, go find your own territory. You're grown up enough. Go find your own food, water, shelter, and space. And so we see that black bears are dispersing. And so we always see a peak in the summertime. Some summers we see lots of black bear activity and, and some we don't. Oftentimes that's weather related. So if they're finding a lot of natural food sources, they're not gonna come raid bird feeders and beehives. But if there's a drought condition and they're not getting lots of fruits and nuts, not having a lot of success hunting, then they're gonna be more apt to try and take advantage of human related food items. So it ebbs and flows. Here's another look at sightings over the course of years. So if you look at 1993, that's when we started our formal reporting system. And we've kept a log of all the sightings that we've received over the years. And it peaked in 2000, looks like 2012 um, was the, the highest number of sightings we ever received, which is a combination of things. And that's a lot of it has to do with weather. And if 
a, the weather conditions encourage bears to come closer to human activity and take advantage of bird feeders and garbage and things like that. But also um, it could be because of different campaigns that we've done over the years to try and encourage the public to contact us and tell us about reports. And we see that ebb and flow too. If we do a, a pr um, pretty progressive program to try and educate Ohio Ohioans that we want to know about black bear activity, then we get a huge influx of reports. And then if we don't do it for a year or two, then it starts to fade because people think, well, I've already reported black bear activity before, I don't need to do it again. And that's not true. Even in Ashtabula County, which is the northeastern most county in Ohio, we get a lot of black bear activity, but we wanna know about all of it because we wanna be able to compare data from one year to the next. Here's one more map to show you what the distribution is like of sightings of black bears. And I mentioned Ashtabula County, and that's one of the darkest counties that's on this map in extreme Northeast Ohio, right along that Pennsylvania border. And just south of that, the highest number of sightings is in Trumbull County. And that's because there's not a lot of people up there. Plus it's right there on the border. So it's pretty comfortable for black bears. Oftentimes though, they venture into Ohio, spend a few weeks or a couple of months and then turn around and go back eastward. So they're trying to get away from older competing bears, especially these young males. They don't wanna compete with older, more established black bears. They're just too small and too weak and not ready for a fight. But they come into Ohio and discover a lot of humans and dogs barking at them and cars buzzing by and it's just not that comfortable. But if they can make their way southward along the border, along in West Virginia, then they can find a lot fewer people and a lot more space. So, um, and if they come straight into to Ohio from West Virginia, they may hang around. And that's why you see that there's not, not the lightest um, color of blue here, but in Hawking, Vinton, Athens, Washington counties, these don't have a lot, these counties don't have a huge human population like we do in Northeast Ohio. Um, but there is a lot more activity of bears coming in from Pennsylvania than West Virginia um, down in here. And, and you can imagine that that's probably because of the Ohio River. Black bears are great swimmers, but that takes a lot of energy and it's pretty risky for them to swim across the Ohio River. So oftentimes, even if they're a West Virginia bear, they may wander up north and then cross over into Ohio and then come back down south, if that makes sense, just to avoid the Ohio River. And that's probably why we get some activity in Adams and Scioto and Lawrence County, um, because they're trying to avoid the Ohio River or going around here in, in the southernmost part of the state. We have occasionally, we, we um, experience conflicts, uh, Northeast Ohioans especially might in, see conflicts with black bears, especially in those su summer months when um, we're experiencing a drought or there's just not a lot of natural food sources for bears and they're more likely to want to come in and raid those bird feeders and beehives and raid some garbage and eat pet food that's left out overnight. These are all easy meals, especially for these young bears that are tired and worn out from their adventure across the state border. So we have to always keep in mind that if somebody uh, thinks that this bear is, is becoming a, a big conflict, we have to determine if in fact it really does warrant us to get more involved. We want people to understand that um, that folks all across the country coexist with black bears, but we also want to do it safely um, for humans as well as black bears. So there's a lot of things that we take into account. And so we think about public safety, of course, is that bear becoming habituated? Does it, has it lost its fear of humans? And if so, that doesn't mean all is lost, but what steps do we have to take to reinstill that fear that that black bear should have? We don't see that this, that much in Ohio because these bears don't stick around and tolerate humans. But if you think about any time that you may have spent in the Great Smoky Mountains, that's what we're talking about. And that's something that we have to really avoid. We don't want bears to associate humans directly with food. We do not want people feeding bears, especially hand feeding bears and teaching those bears that we're nothing to be afraid of because that's when bad things happen. So we'll encourage people to take down those bird feeders and protect the beehives, maybe with an electric fence and scare the black bear away, shout and clap your hands and make that bear fearful of your presence. And then those are all really good steps to take that, that the public can do, but we can also become involved too. And if you see this line here that the for the hazing secondary objective, noisemakers, rubber bullet and buckshot, that's a step that we take when a bear is becoming habituated and it's just not fearful of, of humans. 
but not habit not quite habituated yet, but it's starting to lose its varicumins. We had a bear just a few summers ago. It really took a liking to someone's swimming pool. And at night after night, it would it would flop into the swimming pool and swim around and it no longer ran away when the people would walk out on their back porch and clap and shout and turn on the security light. It decided it wasn't gonna run away anymore. That was not good. And thankfully they contacted us. We sent a biologist out and, at night and he snuck up on this bear and he shot it in the butt with some rubber bullets. And I can attest to you that based on what I know about these rubber bullets, it hurt. It hurt really bad, but it, it didn't permanently injure the bear in any way. It just bruised the, the snot out of this bear. It ran away. It had a bad experience with that neighborhood and it didn't come back. And that's what we like to see. It went elsewhere where it wasn't creating a conflict and becoming habituated to humans. So those are the, the steps that we try to take to try to teach humans that we can live with these bears, but try to teach the bears where the, those boundaries are too, if that makes sense. So if it does become a situation where we have to take it another level, this bear is not responding to harassment, we might have to employ this very fancy culvert trap here that was made by a local Boy Scout. It's just on a trailer, it's a culvert pipe on a trailer with a cage door, and we're able to trap and relocate a bear if we need to. And in all my 18 years of working for the state, of Ohio, we've only had to trap and relocate two bears. And this bear was when I first started the job in 2003, we had a bear trying to cross I-90 at rush hour in Trumbull County, right along the Pennsylvania border. And we knew that was gonna be bad news for everybody involved. And so we decided to, to try and trap this bear and move it to a safer place. And we succeeded in doing that. But when we are put in that position, we have to go through these motions. It's a lot of energy and time and labor involved in catching this bear, and it's a lot of stress on the bear. So we want to make the most of every opportunity, and we were able to with this bear. We plugged two um, yellow tags, in, or one in each ear, so you can see in the top center photo, there's a yellow tag. It's marked with an individual number, so if we do run into this bear again, we know which bear it is and we weigh it, we look it over for any physical characteristics that will differentiate it from other bears or maybe healthy or unhealthy about the bear. And then we extract a tooth. And that's what this photo is in the bottom center. We extract a tooth and then we can cross section it. And just like a horse tooth, if you're familiar, we can age the bear like, on, like tree rings. We can count the rings on the tooth and get an indication of how old that bear is. And it's quite accurate. So we're able to get some great data and then we let the bear sleep off the sedative and make sure that it wakes up and it feels all right. And we watch it and we watch this particular bear wander off in, into a safe place um, that was much more isolated and not near I-90 during rush hour. So moving on to bobcats, everything going okay, Jen? Yeah, Jamie, I was gonna say, we've only got a couple questions about bears. So maybe we should go through those before we move on to the cute little bobcats. Uh, we couple questions about hibernation. So uh, you mentioned that you mentioned torpor, but could you talk a little bit more about whether or not bears are true hibernators? Like for example, someone noticed that the trail cam said January 5th, and is that common to have them out and about um, in January? Sure, yeah, these are great questions. So in Ohio, despite what you might think, and despite what I think, our, our winters aren't that bad. And I, uh, I don't love snow, I'm gonna put it out there, but in a, I'm a, not, I don't, I'm not suited for the cold, but bears are indeed suited for the cold. So in our more northern states and in, in Canada, for instance, where it does get brutally cold and the snow gets very, very deep, making it really hard to move around, even for a black bear, they are much more likely to hibernate. In, in more mountainous regions of Pennsylvania, for instance, the weather is just really rough and tough in the winter time. So they're gonna just sleep it away. And that's not to say even hibernation, they can wake up here and there, um, but they won't, they won't be as likely to venture out of their den, out of their cave, for instance, and move about where torpor, that's what makes it different. They can sleep a deep sleep for a few days. And then if a really nice warm winter day comes along, the sun is shining, it makes it up into the 30s, 40s, or even the 50s, bears are gonna take advantage of that. They're gonna move out of their, their den site or their cave or wherever they're sleeping and move around a little bit. But then if the weather takes a nasty turn, then they'll go back into torpor and go back into their deep sleep. So in Ohio, we, we don't have that much winter activity for bears. We do have what our biologist estimates. It's just a rough estimation of maybe 50 or 60 resident bears, meaning that they stay in Ohio all year round. 
and most likely they're torporing, that they're sleeping for a few days here and there, waking up, moving around the landscape, and then going back to sleep when the weather gets cold again. So we, I, I'm guessing we don't have any hibernating bears in Ohio, but I don't know that to be absolutely true. Excellent. And then one more sort of related to what you just ended with. Does ODNR track confirm sightings of breeding black bears in Ohio? We do. And I am so excited you asked that question because it was just, I want to say three years ago, time gets away from me sometimes, but I'm pretty sure it was three years ago that we confirmed the first activity of breeding black bears in Ohio. And that was by way of a sow with cubs. So the only thing is that we can't confirm that she did indeed give birth to those cubs in Ohio, but it was in Ashtabula County, right along the Pennsylvania border. And she was in fact in Ohio. She ran across the road in front of a car that was safe and made it across with two cubs. And fortunately the uh, passenger of the vehicle was able to get video and send it to us. And so we saw these little babies, they weren't crazy young, but they, they were, big enough that they were ready. They had been three months old at least because this is when they venture out and start moving about. But even then they're not quite strong enough to keep up with mom for very far distances. So we either think that they were born really close to that spot or maybe at that point the, the cubs were four or five months old and they were able then to stretch the legs enough to move about. And in that case, we don't know where they were born, but we've had since then, that was the most exciting because that was the first time in, in our modern history since 93 of, of following these reports that we had any breeding activity. And then since then we've had another sow, could be the same one, we're not quite sure, show up with cubs just this past summer with three cubs. So I think my timeline is about right because they don't give birth every single year. So yeah, that would be right. It could have been the same sow, um, but there's no way for us to know. We're based on her movement and activity and the timeline, we're thinking it is, but we'll know more as time goes on, hopefully. Excellent, and a little division um, insight here. Is that Jeff Westerfield in the bear picture? Oh, it is, <laughs> it is indeed. Many years ago, but he still looks as good as ever. All right, time for the elusive bobcat. All right. Bobcats have a very, very wide range. And you can, you can see by this yellow shading all across the United States, there's very few places that they aren't found in the contiguous United States. And they even drift up into Canada and into Mexico. And if you look closely, do you see the, the green that's not covered in yellow along the North shore of Ohio and in Michigan and across Wisconsin and Minnesota. Does anybody know what we refer to um, in the world of agriculture? If you're thinking corn belt, you nailed it. So this is the corn belt. And typically this was not ideal habitat for bobcats and maybe ideal is still too strong of a word, but bobcats have since started embracing the corn belt. They like trees, they like uh, forested habitat, but Bobcats are proving to us with their growing population that they're willing to tolerate and able to find comfort in even the corn belt. So this, this will, in the next several years, start to be shaded too as this map is updated. Bobcats, just like black bears, were common prior to settlement, prior to the date of, the state, date of statehood for Ohio, which you might be rattling off is 1903. So we... Um, unfortunately removed all bobcat activity because of unregulated hunting and habitat loss. There was just nowhere for them to go. So they either went elsewhere or weren't able to successfully reproduce. And did I say 1903 for the data statehood? I think I'm wrong about that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said 1903, um, but 1803, right? I'm having a mental breakdown for a moment. Um, but maybe somebody can put in the Q&A box and, and fix that for me, but they, they were common in the 1700s and 1800s, but were extirpated by the mid 1800s. And uh, it was a rapid, rapid decline. Um, but fortunately they were able to recover again on their own. We did not reintroduce bobcats, just like with black bears, they were able to recover solely on their own thanks to protections of enforcement of regulations protecting their populations and recovery of some habitat 
that contributed to a resurgence in bobcat activity. And we were able to report in um, Southern Ohio and Scioto County in 1946 was our first modern day bobcat sighting. We noticed reestablishment was really taking um, taking uh, a rapid increase by the early 1990s. So that's when we started a formal reporting system. Right now, they are currently unlisted. They're no longer listed as a state endangered species. They were um, state endangered for a, a long time and then they were upgraded to state uh, threatened. And now they are currently unlisted, but that doesn't mean that they're not protected. There's no hunting, there's no trapping. Uh, you can't have one as a wild bobcat as a pet. They are still protected, just not by any specialty categories, if that makes sense. Bobcats can vary a lot in appearance, but they all have some, some uh, share some similar characteristics. If you look at the bobcat behind me, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's kind of got a little bit of a brownish gray tone. That's typically what we see in this part of the United States. In the Midwest, they tend to be more gray, where if you travel south or southwest, they tend to be a little bit more reddish. It's probably to do with the landscape and trying to camouflage and blend in. So they can vary and they get a little bit um, grayer or more brownish in the winter. And you might be thinking that's similar to deer and that's right, white-tailed deer are the same way. They tend to be a little bit more reddish in the summer, a little bit more gray in the winter, just helps them camouflage. But what they do all share, regardless of, of if it's more brown, if it's more red, you can see on these legs, they have a little bit rusty color, usually a little bit rusty coloration, and then the barring on the inside of the legs. And in fact, that barring can help biologists identify individuals because it is still unique. Even though most of these bobcats that we see in Ohio have this black barring, if a biologist looks at pictures of, of a few individuals enough, they can start to learn to tell one from another and recognize those creatures, which is pretty cool. You see the rough, the, the fur that's coming out of the cheeks, that's very characteristic of bobcats. It helps them hear, it helps them collect sound. It makes them have excellent abilities to, to hone in while they're hunting. And you see the, the white spots on the backs of the ears, that's identifying too. So they're black ears with white spots and tipped with little tiny tufts, not quite as much as a, a Canada lynx, for instance, um, which is a cat that's more associated with Northern climates, but it, they have bigger tufts. So we're not likely to ever see a lynx here in Ohio. We just don't have the right habitat and climate for, that would make them comfortable enough. We looked at tracks for a black bear. And if you remember, black bear tracks are very human-like with those five toes. And that's how you tell a bobcat track from a bear track or even a coyote, a coyote track from a bear track is that bobcats and coyotes or cats and dogs only have four toes. And cat tracks are very round. So I'll step back. Jen and I were just having this conversation because we're both nerds who love geeking out on tracks. And we um, were talking about how round a bobcat track looks where dog tracks tend to be a lot more oval. So you can make that out here probably by seeing, just kind of looking, looking um, not too closely at, at too fine of characteristics, but just taking a step back and seeing the, there's some shape that helps you differentiate. And with coyote or dog tracks, oftentimes claw marks are present where of course you're not gonna see bob cat claws because they're retracted as they're walking along. And size is um, another characteristic that you can look at. Um, bobcat tracks are gonna be a little bit more petite than coyote tracks. So if you get, if you are able to, to find tracks and you don't know what they are, just snap a picture. But the very important um, thing to consider is putting something in the picture for scale, like a pencil, a set of card keys, a cell phone, something that is universally known to be um, a, a rough size. And they can show us when you email the picture roughly how big that track is. And also what's important is to look at the stride. So from one track from the front foot to the back foot, how long is that stride? And that gives you an indication of how big that body is on the animal. And then also the straddle. So as the animal's walking along, how, how wide is that left foot from the right foot, if you can tell that. So put a ruler in for scale and that'll help a lot too in determining, are you looking at a house set of house cat tracks or are you looking at bobcat tracks? Because bobcats, even though their body size aren't that much bigger, 
they are, their stride and straddle is going to be bigger than your average house cat in most circumstances. So they, um, from the head and body, they're about 26 to over 40 inches, um, where that then they have that little bob tail, as you can see, sticking up on the mount here. They have a, that, hence their name, Bobcat. They have um, just a couple inches to up to seven inch long tail. And they can get up to 30 pounds, but that's a very substantial male. It's a very sturdy male. So for a 30 pound bobcat, that's a big bobcat. So here's a good comparison of a mountain lion or a cougar, which we don't see in Ohio. We haven't had any reports, definitive confirmed reports of mountain lions in the state of Ohio. So if you do see a feline, it's likely gonna be either a house cat or a bobcat. And 20 years ago, I would have said that nine out of 10 times, if not more, that sightings are of domestic cats, but anymore because of the population continuing to grow at a good rate, the chances of encountering a bobcat in Portage County and surrounding counties is becoming greater every day. So here's another quick quiz from photos submitted to us a while back. Are we looking at a bobcat? The photographer wants to know. And on the left-hand side, that's a really good picture. You might not think so because we can't see the head, but we can see that very definitive bob tail. Not to say that house cats don't sometimes have bob tails, but we're looking for that black tip at the tail. So that bob tail with the black tip, you can see a little bit of faint barring on the legs if you look closely enough. Those are all characteristics that make us immediately guess that we are indeed looking at a, a bobcat. And then we had additional photos, which is always very helpful. And look at those ears in the right hand image. You can see the, the black ears with the white spots and that's very characteristic. So as soon as we saw that, we knew we were very likely looking at a bobcat. What about this photo? This picture was sent to us from Stark County probably 10 years ago now. And the photographer was very, very certain that it was a picture of a mountain lion. They were absolutely without a shadow of a doubt um, convinced that it was in fact a mountain lion. So I'll zoom in for you and you can look closer and see what you think. And my immediate instinct when I laid eyes on this photo was to look at that paw. And if you can see the paw that the, the cat has its head up, it's looking to the right, it's sticking its paw up like it's maybe preparing to groom. And that paw is very, um, continuous in size from the leg to the ankle to the tips of its toes as best I can tell. If it was a mountain lion, they have extremely chunky feet. So it would, it would be consistent from the leg to the ankle perhaps, but just explode into this massive chunky paw. And I don't see that there. So that was my first indication that I know it wasn't a mountain lion because otherwise there's no scale. And I don't know how big the bushes are. I don't know how far back behind that fence this animal is. Um, but it did turn out to be a house cat. We went out, we measured the, the surrounding um, objects in the landscape and were able to determine that we were very sure that it was a house cat. And furthermore, that we were um, told by the photographer that there was a coyote standing in the left, on the left side, if you see them just right of the post, staring down the mountain lion, but it turns out that it was just a stump. So it's just amazing the tricks that our eyes can play on us sometimes. Here's one more image. I'm asking you if you think it's a bobcat. And I can tell you definitively that it was in fact a bobcat. My good friend and colleague, Lori, who Jen knows really well, was sitting in her tree stand just a few winters ago and was able to lay eyes on, on a bobcat in the flesh. She was pretty stoked about it and immediately sent me the photo and said, I have a bobcat walking right by me. And so she was able to snap some pictures. Bobcats are just remarkable predators. They're amazing carnivores and they are the ultimate carnivore. They eat a lot of meat. That's what their bodies are built for is just to eat meat. They actually, unlike black bears, they actually cannot process plant material very well. They have very short digestive systems, very short intestinal tracts, and that takes a lot more energy to, to digest fibers and where meat is very easy to digest. So they depend a lot on bugs, especially when they're young. They eat frogs, they eat birds, they eat fish, they eat rodents. So um, they aren't really specific when it comes to what kind of meat, but it's meat is where it's at. So here, here in this center photo, you can see this, this is a trail camera picture submitted to us. And this bobcat, it's lucky 
day was snatching up a groundhog and that wasn't a lucky day for that groundhog, but that makes up a, a good portion of the bobcat's diet. So if you look at um, the left-hand photo, you'll see that scat again, starts with an S, ends in a T, comes out of you, comes out of me. And bobcat scat is um, a little bit easy to tell apart from domestic dog or even coyote scat because it's blunt on the ends. Feline scat has a tendency to be more squared off where if you're familiar with coyote scat, for instance, it's gonna taper. And um, coyote scat can have lots of fur in it, but look for seeds and nuts and things like that that have been digested. Coyotes eat a lot of, of a wide variety of items where bobcats, you're not gonna necessarily, it would be unusual to see bobcat scat with any kind of seeds in it. Um, and they, if you have any house cats at home, you might recognize the behavior of scratching up the ground and making a place before it go, does its business. But coyote are, coyotes oftentimes will um, use roadways, paved or, or unpaved trails, and they like to, to leave their business in places where it's likely to be seen by other coyotes, for instance. Bobcats will do this under certain circumstances, but cats generally will want to create a little divot and then cover it up afterwards but the bobcats sometimes will leave it exposed. And that's because they're trying to send a message to other bobcats that this is their territory. So if it is exposed, especially near a den site, that's on purpose. So you can't always count on it being um, slightly covered up or totally covered up at all. You can see the picture of the bobcat skull in the bottom right-hand corner. I mentioned that they are the ultimate carnivores, the ultimate predators, and you can see by these teeth Here's a, another uh, prop. So you can see these teeth compared to my index finger that they are massive. So they are very, very good at what they do, ripping and tearing at flesh. And look at that eye socket. So I mentioned that black bears don't have the greatest eyesight. So the eye socket isn't very big. I don't know how well you can tell that, but compared to the, the, the size of its skull, those are, eyes aren't very big, but you can't say that about a bobcat skull. I mean, look at how big this orbital cavity is. They have remarkable eyesight, especially during nocturnal hours when they're most likely to be active. But as you can see by this trail camera image in the bottom center, they can be active during the day too. And a lot of animals have a tendency to be crepuscular. Um, that's active at dusk and dawn during twilight hours, they can see a lot better than prey oftentimes. These predators with these great big eyes can absorb a lot more light than prey that have smaller eyes. Bobcats typically prefer forested habitat, as I mentioned, with the fact that they were, um, the Corn Belt was devoid of bobcats for a long time. But over time, bobcats have proven that they can evolve and become more tolerant of what we suspected was less ideal habitat. So they don't like especially heavily agriculture areas, but that's not to say they'll avoid them altogether. They just have a tendency if there's better options available. For dense forest land and swamp land is where it's at for bobcats to be able to find the things that they depend on, all the rodents and birds and snakes and, and frogs and all that, all that stuff. And they'll even eat fish, as I mentioned earlier. So places that they can find fish is very, makes them very happy. Um, and then where they can find rocks and, and places for den sites. Bobcats will sometimes have multiple den sites and they may use different den sites every day or every night, especially females with young that are mobile. They might have a natal den or a couple of natal dens where they are dedicated with those young, but as the young grow older, then it allows them to be more mobile and then they can choose other places to be along the way. And just like black bears, their territories can vary quite a bit depending on if they're able to find the things that they need to survive. Females have a tendency, like a lot of animals, to have smaller territories where males have larger territories. Females will actually tolerate other males in their territories, but not females. So this is very unusual for animals as a general rule. It's usually the other way around, where a, um, an animal will tolerate other uh, males or other, yeah, other males and, and not females, but with bobcats, they will not allow another female in their territory. Maybe, maybe it's young from um, when she just booted the young out, they're growing up, they're getting older, she might tolerate females that she has produced, but not for long. 
and especially not if they're strangers. She, it, they will have a pretty, pretty rough battle um, to protect their territories. And that's because ultimately they want to protect their young. They want to protect the, the, fat, the items, the things that they need to survive, their food sources. So they will start breeding in January, but they, uh, it may last even into the summer. So they have a very big window of about six to seven months where they are um, able to breed. They'll give, they'll produce one litter a year. Gestation's about two months long. So fe the female will carry their young inside of her for about two months and then give birth up to seven kittens. And we see a lot of females with two or three kittens. Not often do we see more than three kittens, but it has been reported to happen. And at about two weeks of age, much more, much quicker than with black bears, bobcat babies will start to venture out and explore and become so curious that they can't stay inside any longer. The mom will tolerate the young for um, several months and maybe even into the following spring, depending on the circumstances. Um, and then boot them out and encourage them to find their own territory. And they can survive in the wild, regardless of obstacles like um, hunting in other states, road kills, disease, competition with other bobcats. They can live up to a decade in the wild. We have um, an illustration here of the status of bobcats in our neighboring states. So they are protected just like black bears, even though bobcats aren't considered a state endangered species like bobcats like black bears, they are still protected in the state of Ohio as they are in Indiana. So Indiana see, seeing um, a lot fewer reports than us, but they are um, confirming some reports of bobcat activity. And they're guessing that those bobcats are coming in from Kentucky. It's hard to say that we have much bear or bobcat activity from Michigan because there's just so urbanized right over the border that it's tough for some critters to survive and even tolerate that space, but it does happen. We have had black bears wander into Ohio and Indiana from Michigan a few times over the years, but most of our bobcat activity that comes into Ohio is coming from the east, just like with bears from the neighboring states of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. So we started our database in, in the late 1940s, and uh, we started seeing a lot more reports of bobcat activity in the late 90s. And we depend on a lot of information from a lot of different sources, including bow hunter surveys. So if you are a hunter or you know someone who is a deer hunter, we spend a lot of time sitting in our tree stands often. And we see a lot of other creatures and that's all very valuable information to us, especially with bobcats because they are just such weary creatures. And they're, they're so aware all the time of of other activity that they uh, they don't tolerate, uh, like deer, for instance, they may just stand their ground and watch us and be curious about us. Bobcats often will run or just lay down and disappear into the foliage and we never even knew they were there. So someone sitting very quietly taking pictures or sitting in a tree stand waiting for a deer to pass by, this is when we see a lot of bear a lot more bobcat activity, but also we get pictures from trail cameras that's gained a lot of momentum and road kills. Here's a, a graph just to show you how much trail camera uh, trail cameras have contributed to data just in the last few years is that growing popularity of trail camera use has been very advantageous for our surveys for bobcats. Um, but unfortunately, road kills have to. They cross, especially when they're dispersing. These young are looking for new territories. And it's tough in southern Ohio with Route 70 and in northeast Ohio, we have a lot of highway systems and it can make it tough for them to cross. We see most of our reports from two different populations of bobcats in southeast Ohio. So you can see that really shaded county in Monroe County, Noble County nearby is another county that sees a lot of bobcat activity. And this is where in the 90s, we started seeing the most activity. So we must have had a very prolific female reproducing at a rapid rate or uh, at least several females that were very successful in reproduction. And then we noticed that there was another population, another hotspot of bobcat activity in the southern part of the state. And we did a research project to determine and verify that if the information that we have here based on sightings from trail cameras and road kills and eyewitness accounts all matched up with um, information that we were able to collect with boots on the ground circumstances. So I'll go more into that in just a second. 
Um, but here's another visual of the sightings growing from the 70s through uh, just last year. And you can see how the bobcat population has dispersed and we're starting to see a lot more activity in Northwest Ohio as bobcats are probably saturating Southeast Ohio and Northeast Ohio and starting to move their way westward. So when we started the research project, this was a number of years ago, and we're involved in a current research project, which I'll mention too, we had some things in mind, we wanted to determine their distribution and abundance, our goal was to see if it matched the information that we were gathering from the public, just to ensure that our data was consistent and reliable, and we did it through radio collaring efforts and hair snail hair snare and trail camera surveys. And the radio collars were designed to, to eventually fall off and they did a number of years ago and were collected and we were able to get some valuable data. So there's no more bobcats radio collared in the state of Ohio as a result of our survey. And the hair snare survey and the trail camera surveys uh, are no longer out on the landscape. We were able to collect all that equipment after the survey was completed. But here are some pictures to show you a, a, some background, a little bit of insight as to how we were able to complete this survey. So this is a biologist. She has moved on to, other, to another agency. So she's no longer around, but you might recognize Susie and she's setting up a trail camera here. And then this is the hair snare. So this is a piece of carpet that's covered in castor oil. And if you're not familiar with castor oil, it's basically, it's oil from beavers, from American beavers, and it stinks. And bobcats love it. They can't help but want to rub up against it. So when they rub up against this piece of carpet, and they're rubbing their faces and their bodies all over this piece of carpet, they're leaving hair behind, which we can test with DNA to see if there's genetic, genetic variables and differences in the individual bobcats visiting these stations. So here's a picture of what it looks like to be um, involved in this scent station. And you can see that there's two, two trail cameras located at the station. So we were able to get a couple of different vantage shots. And then here's the hair snare at the base of this large oak tree. And it, again, is, it has a scent on it. And we chose two different habitats, two different habitat types rather. So if you're familiar with the wilds near Zanesville, that's extensive previously mined uh, reclamation, reclamation areas that are now extensive grasslands with some in, interspersed trees. And then we chose, some, in the extreme Southern Ohio, we chose very densely mature forested habitat, which we know bobcats like, but we wanted to compare and see how much use was happening in the previously mined sites compared to long time established forested habitats. So we were able to determine that they used both habitats. There, were, there was bobcat presence at both and their density was greater than we expected on the previously mined sites. They liked the grassland habitats. They were able to find plenty of food there. They were able to, to establish territories and be comfortable enough. So we were pleased to see that. So here's another look at what we determined from these surveys, which mass, matched up with the illustrations that our biologists were able to make and the graphs that they were able to make. And they, there's this, um, Jeanette, there, there were these bobcats in Southern Ohio in the Monroe, Noble County, and then ex expanded area as females continue to reproduce and these young bobcats dispersed. If they stayed locally, they were all genetically similar to one another based on these snare hair surveys. They were able to do, there was interrelatedness, but when we looked at Lake Catherine, the really forested habitat in Southern Ohio, this bubble on the left-hand side, these were genetically different bobcats from a different population that were not necessarily related um, for the most part to the, the ones that were further north. So these, these bobcats may have come in from Kentucky and established in Ohio from a totally different population of bobcats. So we were pleased to see some genetic differences because all biologists will agree that you don't want too much interrelatedness in bobcats. So here's some of the images that we were able to capture. And this is a, a female bobcat with one of her young. I mean, you can't get any cuter than that. And this is a bobcat that is using the snare hair um, part of the, the survey site. So it's sniffing and rubbing its face on that delicious, nasty castor oil. And here's another bobcat in the bottom, rubbing its face and leaving its hair behind. And then even though we were looking for bobcats, of course, other creatures couldn't help but um, want to come in and nose around too. So on top of this log, you might be able to make out there's a, a least weasel here popping along the log. And then on the right-hand side, the top right-hand photo, do you recognize that as a gray fox? 
that's pretty exciting. We don't get to see gray foxes in Northeast Ohio very often. So to see this picture from Southern Ohio is always well received. And then here, this is really, really tough to make out. But if you look on the side of this tree, let me go back. I don't know what just happened. Uh oh, what did I do? Got a little ahead of myself. So if you look at this little lump on the left-hand side of the trunk, can you make out a flying squirrel? So the flying squirrel even came into the snare hair trap just to check it out and sniff that castor oil. Exciting stuff. So I mentioned that we're currently involved in another survey. We've partnered with Ohio University and they are helping collect information for us. Student, students at the university are collecting all kinds of valuable data and that's gonna be completed June of this year, hopefully. So stay tuned. We'll distribute information as soon as it becomes available from this study. It'll take us a few months to process it all, but hopefully by this time in 2022, you'll be hearing about updates. Are we good to move on, Jen, or do we have some questions? We do have some questions um, real quick. And I just want to, as I pull these questions up, um, if you have, if you need to head out, it's okay. We hope you'll stick around with us because there's so much good things, so many good things to come. But uh, just know you'll be getting the recording. Um, so if you have any questions, be sure to pop them in. So regarding bobcats, I have two questions I'm going to ask you uh, here. Why do bobcats have white, white stomachs? It's a great question. And that's part of their evolution to help them blend in. It, it may sound ridiculous to have white in an environment, but they don't have to, because their stomachs are facing the ground so much of the time, even when they climb trees and lay on a branch, their stomachs aren't very often exposed. So this is especially important in warmer climates where it's gonna be really hot. A little bit of what is exposed what will help keep them cool in the summer months. And so that's the best thing that I can guess is that it's part of, of, best, of absorbing or, or deflecting sunlight and helping them camouflage with their surroundings. Just like um, a young white-tailed deer, a fawn, they have those speckles that, and those speckles help them with dappled sunlight. They can lay in a little part of forest floor and the sunlight filtering in through the leaves and it's scattering the sunlight and it looks just like speckles on a, a fawn. So I'm guessing it has something to do with camouflage too. Awesome. And another hibernation question. Are the bobcats hibernating now? And if so, where are their preferred uh, locales? Is it true hibernation or just deep torpor? They are very active. Bobcats are very active in the winter time. So they don't typically torpor to my knowledge. They have those long legs. As you can see on the mount behind me, they are very leggy creatures helping them get through pretty deep snow. And they've got pretty dense fur that keeps them warm. They're highly active animals so that keeps their blood flowing. They're efficient predators. So they're usually, if they're um, seeking out rodents, for instance, squirrels are gonna be active and chipmunks are gonna be active on warm winter days. So as long as they can find food to sustain them, they're gonna be active. But if the weather does take a really, really nasty turn and it's just too cold for them, then, and their food sources aren't available, then they're gonna definitely sleep it off. So torpor is unusual unless we have a really bad stretch. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Jamie. All right, I'm gonna to try to wrap this up as quickly as I can. Um, we're moving on, we just have two species left and we're gonna talk about the river otter. So just like the bear brethren and the bobcat brethren extirpated in the 1900s because of habitat loss and pollution to our waterways, unregulated hunting and trapping. But fortunately, we were able to reverse that and allow river otters to rebound in the Buckeye State. And now we have a very healthy population of river otters. I have yet to see one in the wild of Ohio, but it's gonna happen one of these days, I just know it. So in 1986, unlike bears and bobcats, we actually initiated a pretty serious reintroduction effort. We brought in 123 otters from Southern states of Arkansas and Louisiana and, re and released them into our major waterways, Kilbuck Kil and Grand River, Little Muskingum and Stillwater Creek. These are all major water sources where river otters will be happy. And they blew us away with the reproductive efforts. They in just a few years time, they exceeded our goals, which were for 15 years or more. So they, they, as soon as we 
brought them to the landscape. They just um, made themselves comfortable and did exceptionally well. And we were able to um, then just make the decision that in order to reduce conflicts and allow opportunity to keep the population healthy, we were able to initiate a highly regulated trapping season in 2005. And that was far and away much sooner than we ever imagined when these otters first showed up on the landscape in Ohio back in 1986. So their population just did exceptionally well, which is very pleasing. They are amazing creatures that are adapted so well for the environments in which they live. Clearly river otters love to be in aquatic habitats and they are suited for it. They are so, their streamlined bodies just shoot right through the water like a rocket. They have very strong muscular tails that help them, that act as a rotor in the water and it helps them swim much more efficiently. That sleek, dense fur, oh, I have it right here as a matter of fact. Look how sleek and dense this fur is. It's very thick and shiny. All those oils protect them from cold water. So even in the coldest days of winter, if they can find open water, they're gonna be swimming because deep down below those garden areas, that oil keeps them nice and dry right at their skin. So they can stay very comfortable even in the nastiest days of winter. And they have webbed feet similar to a duck, but not extensively as a beaver, if you're familiar. Their feet are a little bit more petite than a beaver and a little bit more muscular, but they still have that a little bit of webbing in between. So look for that when, when you look at tracks. It's not always gonna be apparent, but if you see some sort of connective tissue of, of impression in between the five toes and you see claw marks, that's a good indication that you have river otter tracks. And remember the stride and straddle too. The behavior of river otters are, are like other creatures that are similar, mink for instance, weasels, they're all cousins to each other essentially. They're very high energy, so they're going to be bouncing all over the place, and they're social creatures too, so if you see one set of tracks, look around. You're probably going to see multiple sets of tracks because they like to stay in, um, in a few numbers or family units, and they can get sub pretty substantial size, up to 30 pounds, so river otters and bobcats are, are up there in about size-wise. So is this a river otter? Think about why you think it is or is not. Look at those ears, look at where the eyes are set, look at that chunky nose. And behind the eye, I'm guessing at least my eyes were drawn, drawn right to the head. I see the whiskers sticking up, but look behind the head. Do you see that body above the, the surface of the water? We're actually looking at an American beaver, as you might've guessed. So this is a beaver with large round ears, eyes set right way up on top of the head, and there's a little bit of bump above where that eyebrow would be on humans, and then a chunky, very, very chunky nose. What about this critter? Is this a river otter? Another creature that you're likely to encounter in aquatic habitats, this is a muskrat. So its entire body is exposed and they tend to be a little bit more chestnut color, but you can't totally rely on that. River otters have a tendency to be uh, dark, dark brown, but they can vary. Many species of wildlife can vary. So you only have to use that as an, an indication, but not 100%. But this animal is much smaller than a river otter. And look at those tiny little beady eyes. They Muskrats have terrible, terrible eyesight. So those teeny little eyes give it away. And here we have a couple of river otters. So they have chunky noses like beavers, but look how tiny the ears are there. So the ears don't stand out quite as much as like they do on, on beavers. And the whiskers, they go down and back to make them more streamlined, more efficient in the water where the beavers had whiskers sticking out all over. They have eyes that are not quite as big as beaver, but much larger compared to their heads than muskrats. So here's a close-up look at a river otter skull. Look how flat that head is. So again, very streamlined for the water. This is just like a mink, very um, flat head. This is classic mustelid or weasel-like skulls. They have these real flat heads. Muskrats have flat heads too, helping them be streamlined and, and camouflaged in the water. And then excellent nasal cavities for, for excellent sense of smell. And they eat a lot of meat. That's primarily their diet. So they have these big canine teeth. They're efficient for eating flesh. So they don't deviate from meat too often. They love fish and 
living in the water as much as they do, that would make sense. So here we have a curious little otter sticking its head up. If you watch long enough, you stay quiet. These are very wary creatures. You're going to have to be very, very quiet if you want to watch river otters. They don't, they're curious, but they don't tolerate humans too well for very long. So try to pay, be as quiet as you can. If you're fortunate enough to see an otter, you might see this. And they're going to be looking at you, showing a little bit more of themselves and helping you confirm that you are, in fact, looking at river otters. So they eat, eat a lot of fish. They love freshwater mussels. They love crayfish, but they'll also eat snakes and frogs and ducks if they can get a hold of them, as well as mammals. They have to fuel their systems at a rapid rate because they are such high energy creatures that they can't turn much down. So exposed with an opportunity, they're going to embrace it for every chance that they get. In the bottom left hand picture, if you don't recognize this photo, it's of a latrine. This is river otter scat. And it's very similar to bobcat scat, but there's some things to keep in mind. So it's blunt and it has segments in it. And they'll leave it exposed oftentimes on top of dirt or on top of snow, but there'll be scratch marks around and multiple otters will use, hence the name latrine, multiple otters will use the same spot. So you oftentimes don't see just one leaving of scat, but multiple leavings of scat and look for those tracks and the trail drag marks too. And if you uh, see the trail tail drag marks, you're very likely looking at an otter, especially if it's long and thin. If it's wide, then that's the flat tail of a beaver, but beavers don't use latrines. So that's how another way to differentiate. And otters are messy. So in this bottom left, this bottom center picture, this is a carp that was drug up out of the water and it was fed upon a little bit and the rest was left and then the latrine was nearby with plenty of tracks and tail drag marks to prove that it was in fact river otter activity. They prefer habitat with water, of course, so lakes and marshes and healthy river systems is perfect for them. And they like places where they can find log jams and lots of debris that helps them hide if they feel threatened and just makes them feel a little bit safer. They will move about a lot. I keep mentioning how high energy they are, and it's been reported that they've moved up to 26 miles a day, not in the winter, because they can't afford to burn that much energy, but in the summer months, they can, because there's plenty of food on the landscape, so they'll be all over the place, just checking things out, hunting, playing, and socializing with their, within their family units and just adventuring on the landscape. The breeding is in early spring. They can have up to six pups. They're totally helpless for the first several days into a couple of weeks of their life. So they're completely dependent on the mother. And in about two months, they'll emerge from the den and start honing their hunting skills and, and feeding their curiosity. But by six months, they really don't have to have mom anymore. They can survive on their own. Although having mom around is just much safer for them and they're still learning. So it's helpful for, for mom to still stick around. But if mom um, leaves for any reason, they don't have mom around anymore, they can still survive and they can survive up to 13 years in the wild. Their populations have just skyrocketed, not just in Ohio, but in all of our surrounding states. The populations are doing very, very well. We conduct surveys every year and the first bullet point, we do, you'll see that we conducted surveys in District 3 and 4, that's Northeast and Southeast Ohio since 2000. Then we added additional survey sites seeing the population grow in 2016. So we added sites to the rest of the state and now we're conducting over 400 bridge site surveys every year. And that means that at any bridge crossing that's been designated a site, our biologists will visit that bridge in the winter time and then look around that bridge. This is just a marking point for us to be consistent along a waterway. So we know that that bridge is the survey site and any, and any indication of otter activity within that site will be cataloged. So if we find latrines, we find fish that have been fed upon that we believe is river otter activity. If we find tracks and we actually, if we in fact actually see otters all the better. So all those red triangles are all spots where otter activity has been found at our survey sites. We also have to look at harvest rates. So we're, we, trappers are allowed to harvest a, a limited number of otters every year. And it's really important and valuable data for us to follow along the harvest rates and the pelt prices. If pelt prices go down, tra trappers are less likely to pursue river otters. 
And then that makes it look like the population has fallen, but that's not the case. And in fact, it may be because of limited, har limited harvest, they will, um, the population will be greater the following year. So we have to look at that to help uh, contribute and supplement to our data information. So here's a map just similar to the bear and bobcat mat maps that we looked at. This is the abundance of harvest in the state of Ohio. And you can see that we have dense populations of river otters in the extreme Northeast Ohio, including Portage County, because there's a lot of water, not a ton of human activity. So it's pretty comfortable for them, not as comfortable in our other um, counties, more urban counties like Cuyahoga with Cleveland, Summit County with Akron, Stark County with Canton. That's not to say we don't have river otter activity, we do but it's very limited compared to the other states, which is why in the white counties, there's no otters harvested there. Let's move on and finish up with talking about fishers. We have fishers in Ohio. They're few and far between, but they are here. And if you have an old version of our Ohio Mammals Field Guide, which is free, if you call 1-800-WILDLIFE, you'll see a page dedicated to animals that have been extirpated in the state of Ohio, including wolf, including marten, and mountain lion, or otherwise known as cougar, and fisher is listed there, but we have since been able to change that. Even though they were extirpated by the mid 1800s, we have now cataloged eight sightings since 2013 in five different counties. So not, not in Portage County, so get out there adventure seekers and find a, a fisher, hopefully in a Portage Park District location and tell us about it. They're currently listed as a species of special interest. So we're paying a lot of attention to observation and activity of fishers in Ohio. And this is a, um, a category that's dedicated to wildlife that is capable of breeding because we've seen both males and females and starting to expand from populations in our neighboring states. And it's become pretty consistent every year. We're guaranteed to have some sort of fisher activity, it feels like anyway. So this is why we're taking a more interest in this animal. It's a beautiful weasel looking creature that has a long stout body, is usually brown in color. The males have some blonde characteristics to the fur, especially around the shoulders or across the back. And they can get up to 13 pounds. So males are a little bit more substantial usually where females are about half that size. And they have semi-retractable claws. So this can make tracking fishers a little bit challenging because you don't know if you're gonna see those claws or not. If they have the claws exposed, then you might see them. And if they have them pulled in, then they might not show up depending on the soil structure. But with weasels, the best thing I can tell you about looking at a, a, a weasel track is that they look like a star shape to me. I mentioned that canines have like more of an oval shape where cat tracks are almost round or, or perfectly round in some cases, where with weasels like mink and otter, and even though um, we don't see a lot of fisher activity. Hopefully you do sometime and you'll notice that star shape where sometimes the claws are present. So um, in this, this uh, image down here in the right hand corner, I don't know if you can make it out. It's hard to describe, but I see a star usually because of those claws that make it point if in fact the claw is there. So again, the thing that you need to look at is stride, straddle and behavior. These fishers Fishers are, are excellent tree climbers. So if you see these tracks going across the snow or across a, a muddy or sandy soil, exposed soil, and then it looks like it climbed up into a tree, that's not typical mink behavior. It could be weasel behavior, but fishers are a lot bigger than the weasels that you're gonna encounter in Ohio. So this, that's where the stride and straddle becomes very important. Here's a trail camera image of a very dense, densely furred fisher, very healthy looking creature. And this was visiting a bait site. A hunter had put out corn. And although fishers don't eat corn, they eat what's attracted to corn. So chipmunks, squirrels, mice, and so forth. They eat a lot of meat, but they'll eat nuts and fruits and berries too. Um, so they, they aren't too particular. I went to grab for a fisher skull, but I don't have one. I could not find one. So I apologize. I don't have a prop for a fisher, but maybe someday I will. Um, but it's tough to, to tell fisher scat from other scat. The best thing I can tell you is that it does taper. So it's similar to canine scat in that fashion. It's going to have a lot of fur, maybe some feathers that weren't digested and um, look again for those tracks. Look for the behavior and the habitat type that you're in. 
they like forests, which explains why most of the sightings that we have received is along the Pennsylvania border in Ashtabula, Trumbull counties, Geauga Lake. They like to be where there's trees where they can find happy places to burrow and produce young. So males generally have larger home ranges than females, but they will tolerate a little bit of overlap with other males, which is unusual for, for wildlife, generally speaking. And they are ready to breed at just one year of age. So they're pretty prolific breeders. Reproduction usually peaks in March, but their breeding activity can continue through May. This is when we see our, when we get more reports. Even though we've only gotten reports, we've noticed consistency in those reports being around this time. So these males are looking for a companion with which to breed or maybe looking to establish or expand territory. And that's when we are receiving these sightings. Delayed imp implantation occurs just like in black bears and eventually the egg will be fertilized in the female and she can produce up to three kits typically. They're partially furred but pretty dependent on mom for a while. And then they'll disperse by about five months of age. This is a very different looking map than the other creatures we looked at. So the populations in our neighboring states to the east with Pennsylvania and West Virginia where, where fishers have been reintroduced successfully those populations are doing really well and have a regulated season as well as in Michigan, again, where populations were introduced, reintroduced in order to help the population rebound at a more rapid rate. In Ohio, they're here completely on their own thanks to those neighboring populations doing so well. And there have not been reports yet in Indiana and Kentucky, but it's eventually gonna happen. As you can see by this map, these are the reports that we've been able to catalog so far. These red stars indicate where these sightings have occurred along the PA border. And then we have this random in Lake County, this red star up here along our North Shore. It, this fisher made it all the way west, assuming it came from Pennsylvania, and made it into Lake County, only to be struck by a car on Route 90, unfortunately, or Interstate 90. So, um, wasn't able to make it any farther than that, but hopefully as time continues, our fisher populations will continue to expand. And we're also getting more um, reports of porcupine activity. And there's likely a connection there because fishers do eat a lot of porcupine. So maybe they're following their food source. We will hopefully find out more as time continues. So if you have any information to share with us while you're out hiking and hunting and fishing and whatever else you might be doing, please report anything of interest to our wildlife species sighting reporting page at wildohio.gov. My email address is on this slide. You can also visit our website at wildohio.gov or call 1-800-WILDLIFE if you ever have any wildlife related questions or concerns or sightings or any of that good stuff. And without further ado, I give the screen back to Jen. Great job, Jamie. I'll give you the round of applause. I know that there's <laughs> folks applauding here. <laughs> Thank you. So I do have a, a well, first, Portage County uh, Park District folks that are on the line tonight, please tell your friends and neighbors to keep your eyes peeled for those fishers. All of our neighboring county, they should, we know they're there, right? <laughs> Indeed. So I have a question for you, Jamie, um, that came through. It says, are there any critters that are due for introduction um, in Portage County, you know, specifically so we can keep our eyes peeled in, in our Portage Park District properties? I wish, but no, not to my knowledge. That is way above my pay scale, all those decisions, but I haven't heard of anything. There's been rumors over the years of um, certain individuals trying to um, encourage Division of Wildlife to reintroduce elk because we hear all these exciting stories of reintroductions in neighboring states like Pennsylvania and Kentucky and Michigan and elk are super cool animals, but I don't know of anything that has gained any traction. So those are just rumors for now. Excellent. Well, I think we've gone, we've worked through the questions during the presentation. And so if any of you that are listening in and watching tonight, uh, if you have a question that you think about later, you can just email myself or Jamie and we will definitely get it answered for you. So Jamie, thank you so much for sharing. These are some really exciting, uh, exciting good news. Uh, <laughs> it is a lot to talk about. And thank you everybody for sticking with us. Um, I know it's almost 830 and I've taken up an hour and a half of your time, but I hope it was worth it. Thank you so much for sticking okay. it out. I really appreciate it. We have some thank yous coming through. Fabulous information, Jamie. Awesome. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us.